This so, conference will yes, now be recorded. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk, talk a little bit about climate change. Uh, I think we can, we've all got a very good uh, overview about what's happening in our world. Um, you know, say, take away the pandemic, um, there's, there's a number of things that are already happening within that space. So before, before I do that, I think it'd be useful just to kind of give you a bit of a background. I've kind of done it in, in images to give you a bit of an oversight of, of me. Um, for those that don't know me, so I have, I joined the railway, I joined British Rail actually, with uh, um, as a graduate engineer uh, many moons ago, um, just just before the death of British Rail. Although Great British Railways kind of resurrects in itself in the, in the very near future, that's that's interesting. Um, I and I, I came in as, as a graduate engineer, got involved with a number of very interesting projects including two bridge installations one, one at uh, Frisbury Park which is quite unique in that right in the middle of the the uh, the, the bridge layout uh, in the, the middle layout we, we, we actually got installed and um, and also a flood alleviation uh, in Maidenhead uh, on the Great Western Main Line uh, which was a bridge bridge push into uh, into an embankment so very different type of application but some real real uh, some really good experience i, I had first-hand experience in in terms of that uh, and, and kind of the, the old the old saying about uh, measure twice cut once um and to me, to me measure twice fit once um really robert, played you, a lot can, robert you've got a <laughs> notification for your outlook come ah, on okay yeah that out of the way thank you thanks kevin um, I should I turn that off actually? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, so th th that's just some, some of my experience within it. Um, I, I then moved on to uh, track quality manager and uh, experiences of Hatfield and the, the awful accident that happened there at the time I was track quality manager and some of my personal experiences of the immediate aftermath and the impact on the delivery team, but also on the, the infrastructure itself and, and the way in which we, we, we undertook maintenance particularly. Was something that has always stuck with me uh, and something that will continue to to have quite a profound um, view for, for myself um, so th th those are some some of the, the points of raise the the other the I, I then trans transferred onto onto the Kent area and carried on as a track engineer um, and then depot manager and one of the things I, I learned a lot on the Kent was longitudinal timbers we made some radical changes in the way in which we maintained and managed longitudinal timbers on the southern area um, which was very haphazard when I got there to be a bit more structured in, again following the same manager of in, in, inspection survey measure and install and um, yeah made some real uh, detailed and uh, documented changes to do to, to do that um, and then uh, I came. I joined. I worked worked on, to, on on Anglia for a little bit, and uh, moved on to the West Coast. And the West Coast was a quite exciting time because it's just the beginning of the Virgin High Frequency Services, which started at the end of two thousand eight, um, and a very very um, high profile time. And uh, yeah, a number of um, scars from working on the West Coast, but also with some fantastic opportunities, which um, particularly around culture change, which was really interesting times and uh, learned a lot from that but the other thing which kind of you know get, get into the role like I am in now as David said chief technology officer kind of paved the way for looking at looking forward and it was really about using technology the way in which things are done on the west coast with very little access and um, doing nighttime inspections <clears throat> and using data um, measurement data from trains was certainly a, a very different way of um, managing and maintaining our, our infrastructure and i think that's something that's kind of led me into uh, into the center uh, working in the rail hq within the uh, reliability team and then eventually in the engineering team so that's kind of a, just a potted history of where i have come from and what i'm doing now within the r d sort of leading a, a, a huge r d program within network rail as chief technology officer and also the r d strategy for network rail okay so, yeah, it's a bit slow. Pick up on the far. That's it. Right. So, um, when we talk talk about weather, moving on to the weather issue. So, the 
we all know the issue that you know the weather has on our infrastructure um we only need to look at recent incidents like Carment um, last year in Scotland. Um, unfortunate um, fatalities we had on there to people on the train, and you know the the, the issue uh, surrounding that around convective rainfall and the impact it had on on the environment and on the drainage system. So there's a, a number of issues that uh, we know the weather can have a, a very profound effect on our infrastructure. Uh, we've we, we know the you know the, this time of year um, and some people love the heat i don't particularly like the heat um, and i think as a track engineer i particularly despise the heat um, um, but you know i always tell myself well we shouldn't do we shouldn't have to be afraid of it we actually need to plan better and be in a better position uh, for for uh, managing the heat uh, whenever we, we we get to this time of year but we do see unfortunately incidents such as uh, we we had at on Lincoln with, with a derailment of a freight, freight train um, a few years ago in 2014. And we also understand the impact of desiccation in 2018. Um, we had probably one of our, some of our hottest period, about almost three months worth of continuous hot weather and the desiccation effect on, on uh, parts of uh, parts of the Southeast, particularly where we've got some very, um, we've got lots of clay embankment um, had quite a profound effect and we saw lots of speed restrictions around. So we, we know it's not just necessarily hot, uh, it's windy, there's lots of rain um, and all of that, all of those have a real really big impact on, on the infrastructure. Um, cold, yeah, it doesn't get cold enough these days and there's probably something about um, complacency around being prepared for cold weather and, and managing cold weather better. So there's yeah there's there's a few things we have. Um, the main issue here for us and you know, probably for our the passengers travel on trains is the effect it has on punctuality. You know people get on trains to get from A to B and where they are severely delayed by probably in some cases what they don't deem as bad weather. So you could be sitting in in a train in London heading up towards Manchester um, and because of our um, wonderful climate the way it is in the United Kingdom um, it's it could be absolutely potting down in in Manchester but when you sit in a train going heading north and you're stopped by what you can't see it feels quite um, quite frustrating for the passengers um, and we have to get better at managing our infrastructure um, to try and you know, mitigate those issues uh, we know that it's going to get worse and that's one of the issues we we need to combat So yes, so the other thing is also having an improved understanding of the, the systemic weather impacts on our infrastructure is, is certainly a key thing. And that's evolving around all the things we're doing now uh, within Network Rail to get that better understanding. So we're, we're learning more and more, but we kind of know the things, the factors that affect it. Uh, we just need to be better at understanding them and the combination effect um, as part of the whole system. <coughs> um, from a, I suppose looking at the issues that affect track, um, there's effects of other weather that I've mentioned already. Uh, you know, the, the, the issue we had at Dawlish a few years ago uh, with sea level rise, we know that it's something that's called isostatic bounce, um, no, isostatic rebound, um, which is essentially, if you think about the way in which the, U the United Kingdom is um, formed and where it sits in the Northern Hemisphere, um, if you think about the ice caps that are um, Essentially, the, the ice cap is melting um, up in the North Pole um, and a wave of water coming into the, the South, all that does, it uplifts the, um, the land mass, which is effectively Scotland, the north end of it, and the bottom end of the United Kingdom in the South sinks. Um, so that's, that's what isostatic rebound is. And that effectively results in sea rise, sea level rises, which will have a quite a profound effect. Um, we've seen some of that at Dawlish and that part of the country will essentially um, start um, sinking, um, not, not necessarily just the sea rise, but actually will start sinking. Um, and we have railways along those, those part, that parts of the world which will disappear um, because of where they're situated. So, it, you know, it, it's more than just flooding. There's a number of uh, issues with uh, uh, climate change that have a, a more profound effect on us, even though it's not necessarily in, in, in our country. It's, uh, it's situated because of where we're situated in the world. Um, 
So those, those are the sort of issues that, and ultimately those things will then affect uh, affect our track uh, because if it's flooded, well, we can't run very much on it. Um, and drainage then becomes a, a really important factor within managing our, uh, the, the assets. And um, we've seen lots of flooding events in recent recent years and recent months, which causes uh, a lot of uh, disruption on, on, on the network and also a lot of damage. Um, and just in case the pandemic kind of, I suppose, distracted us slightly, um, it, you know, it, is it a climate emergency? Well, yes, it is. And uh, or we can just stick our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, the reality of it is, you know, the pandemic will come and hopefully go. And yet we've still got the looming issue of climate change to contend with. So it's really important that we do look at the issues. Um, and the last year, if I look at the cost of weather, <clears throat> if you look at the last um, block, uh, 2020, 2021, everything seemed quite rosy. It's not actually that bad compared to what it's been. A lot of that is around passenger numbers, passenger numbers and train service haven't been running as much. So it might be a bit of a blip, but it's still, it's still, you know, we're still in a bad place. What is quite evident in the last couple of years is flooding has become quite a big issue. Um, and since 2018, um, and I know it tends to go in, in sort of uh, um, in cycles, but hot weather has also become a feature. We've seen quite a lot in, um, in 2018, a lot of hot weather. Um, 2019 was more challenging because we had peaks, uh, you know, that one of the highest peaks in hot weather we've had for um, around 20 years. And that, that had an effect on quite an effect for our, on our infrastructure. Um, not as bad as it used to be, but uh, it, you know, kind of still has an effect. You, like, you know, contrast that to uh, previous incidents, I'd say we probably managed it quite well, but it still caused quite a lot of delay. Um, and it was the after effect as well, forget the, uh, forgetting the hot weather, it was the months after that took us quite a lot of time to, to recover from that. <clears throat> okay, um, and the other thing as well is tra track. So there are some designs of our track that we know are more vulnerable to hot weather, and, uh, particularly some of our legacy designs, uh, jointed track, timber to sea layout, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, and tight curves are all areas which we know are all have got a weakness. Um, Fortunately, a lot of those those types of tracks, those designs are not necessarily on a lot of our main lines, but they are on other parts of our network, which we have to be uh, pretty reticent of. And, you know, we, we run a, a system across the whole of the UK. Um, we need to be alive to the fact that we ultimately we don't want to injure anyone at uh, any part of our, of our infrastructure, any part of our network. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to take appropriate measures um, to, to protect protect the infrastructure and protect our passengers. So that's th those are the sort of issues that we have to contend with. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about, you know, how much of that is kind of left on the infrastructure because we've got, we've got some, some idea of that from our, from our, st our statistics. So if we, if we look, then look at the, the projections, um, so a piece of work that's been undertaken called uh, UK, uh, part of the, the UK climate change projections uh, 2018. So every every sort of 10, 10 or so years, uh, eight, eight, nine, 10 years, the uh, climate scientists in the UK um, and also around the world undertake a number of scenario tests and looking at what, looking at the number of measures which they, they, they obtain from uh, climate information and weather information, not just you know, space weather as well. And they look at lots of, lots and lots of, data around um, projections that it previously had and the latest one which is UKCP18 gives them a, a number of emission scenarios it basically gives around it's about 12 scenarios that have been identified um, and that's been broken down into uh, a number uh, into two key areas so sort of a, a medium emission scenarios and, and a high emission scenario um, and those are the most likely likely events that will happen based on the you know countries basically are committed to to various um, emissions and this year we've got cop 26 which is climate it's climate um, climate change uh, conference that's coming up uh, in, in glasgow this year 
um, you know, where, where all the world leaders will come and hopefully, you know, commit to making more drastic reductions to uh, to, to carbon emissions. But I think based on on that on the information we've currently got to hand, where we are heading, the the current projections if we look across the UK is, is essentially we're looking at temperatures in by 2050 in the southeast being probably what you'd experienced in the south of France um, and other parts of uh, you know hot areas in in Italy and um, in, in in Portugal and in Spain, uh, the kind of temperatures that have been seen in the last few years as well in some parts of Europe we will start getting that in, in parts of the southeast and the southwest um, and even Scotland you know which so far the highest temperatures we've seen in Scotland is about 32 degrees um, Celsius and we're talking probably around any anywhere about three or four degrees more than that um, which starts having an, in, an impact and an effect on our on, on our infrastructure in that part of the world um, the spread of jointed track in Scotland is certainly a lot higher than in other parts of the UK, and as, as it is in parts of the northeast and northwest, um, bits of the northeast and also Wales. So you can see, you know, a place like Wales, 41 degrees, 38 degrees, and sort of 41 degrees by 2070, um, starts, you know, putting us in a in a, a very discomfort, very uncomfortable place. Um, if we reach those temperatures and some of our structure is not up to scratch, then we will be running trains because it, will, it wouldn't be a case of 20 mile an hour, we probably won't run trains um, for fear of derailing them. So that's that's the kind of situation when we particularly with just with hot weather, um, that's compounded not just with hot weather. So if we look at projections for rain, rainfall levels will be much more extreme than we have now. Um, and again, that will have an effect for us. The only, the only thing that actually looks, the only piece of sort of weather event that looks, uh, I suppose, slightly kinder us on us, but we, we can't forget that it won't, it won't always be kind on us. Is um, cold weather, so we know that the cold weather will become um, less frequent. We'll still get cold spells, and it will still be um, when it is very cold. It could be quite irregular. It could happen later in the year, so we might get very cold snaps in. Uh, in April and even potentially in May, we might find the seasons become um, quite overlapping, and that's just just the effect of, uh, of climate change that has on us. So the the you know our normal view of planning for hot weather um, from sort of May right through to uh, end of September may not necessarily be in those sort of cycles. We may get some really regular weather, um, some very hot spells in end of February into March. Um, and even back and in, back into October potentially. Um, so the seasons become a bit strange, and that's one of the things we we, we need to be really careful. Of. Okay, um, and then the just yeah, just in terms of trends, um, one of the things uh, worth sharing is we know that you know current trends with, with as the temperature heats up, we know that we we generally get failures. The one thing that we've we've um, evidence is quite strange but uh, and maybe we haven't been tested in, in enough in, in the hot weather but we know that a lot of our track buckles actually uh, actually start happening around the sort of um, 30 to 35 degrees um, uh, so even though we get temperatures you know close we've had temperatures up to 38 um, generally the track would have buckled by then um, and any susceptible track would have buckled by then when it gets hotter it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to buckle the, the challenge we have is as it gets even hotter um, is there there's, there's potentially that lag in um, in, in disturbance um, with that continuous and it depends on how long the hot weather spell arises uh, and goes on for or if it's a short snap um, hot spell um, again the the effect on sort of the lateral stability of the track could be um, quite significant um, and there's a load of factors including disturbance uh, you know, if we've got the the uh, sort of balance profiles and if we retain those. Um, and when you start looking at all those factors, uh, we included, including uh, unstable embankments and um, slight misalignments, all those issues start factoring up into uh, potential areas where you get sudden um, buckle snap. And um, those, are, those are factors that we, we know now, we know those conditions exist. Um, we probably aren't 
that sighted and, and clear enough in, in terms of being able to predict and manage them more effectively. But that's, a, that's an area we need to move into in terms of understanding our data better, being able to collect it um, in a more automated way and help us to, uh, to actually identify what we can do. So that, that's, that's what our trends are telling us. Um, and the disruption it causes, particularly when we put in speed restrictions, you know, it, where, where we have loads and loads of disturbance, um, and which is below standard. Um, our standards will essentially, you know, requires to put in uh, speed restrictions in place, and that, that has a massive impact, impact on, on services. So it's not desirable. It may protect trains from um, catastrophic failures and, and, and accidents, but um, it causes a lot of train delay, um, and that will not, not, we're not going to put our, make our reputation of the rail industry very good um, for our passengers as well. So other, other impacts um, that climate change is likely to have, I mentioned about cold weather. Um, there's also the heat, the, the shrink um, swell effect of, uh, of drought um, and convective rainfall. And um, as I said, major, major floods and coastal storms will be potentially five times more than, uh, more frequent than they are in 20, in, you know, today. So by 2070, they're likely to be more. Um, and then we've got the uh, sort of winds lightning um, effect as well. That's likely to cause quite a lot of um, disruption. So there are a lot of factors uh, in the way in which the weather will, will affect us. <clears throat> um, the, the UK government commissioned a, a piece of work with uh, by the, the uh, National Infrastructure Commission uh, last year. Uh, and one of the things that we I suppose we, we supported some of some of the information that was provided to the, uh, the commission. Uh, one of the things that we, we looked at is that in terms of demands of the industry and also the government um, on improving resilience. Um, there are certain areas which uh, they identified as weak. So although overall the the railway is seen as you know still very safe despite despite the incidents of carbon, um, the railway is still one of the safest in, in Europe, um, in the UK. But it's you know the way in which it handles and and and, and actually deals with uh, with bad weather um, and um, severe weather is extreme weather is, is still quite a challenge for us. Um, and there is a shift towards being able to anticipate, so being able to actually predict what issues we're getting from that. Um, looking at resistance measures, and the resistance measures may be short-term um, work that we undertake. So it could be looking at uh, you know, inspection and putting in place mitigations, <clears throat> um, absorbing some of the, the, the risks associated with, uh, with, uh, with weather um, by you know, implementing um, some uh, enhancements and, and improvements within those. And then there's also the recovery element, which is the way in which you respond to particular incidents and, and rectify situations quickly when they do happen, but we're able to put them right, right reasonably quickly without too much disruption. But the, the, the one of the, the major um, elements that we as an industry need to work towards is adapt, adaptation and, and, trans, and that's really through transformation. It's not, um, you know, just, just making mod, uh, minor modifications, which is more about absorbing it, but it's about really adapting what we do and changing um, significantly. And that, that requires, um, a, a, you know, a good level of uh, um, strategic thought um, in order to push in that direction. Um, for us to actually put ourselves in that position to, to meet some of the challenges we've got. Um, on top of that, we've also got the challenge of, um, you know, the, the government's um, climate uh, um, net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, um, which probably made a little bit steeper with, with uh, the recent announcement. So by 2035, we, we have to at least got 78% um, towards that target. And, that's quite a, that's not long to go it's not far away and that's still quite a tall order when when you imagine that some of the technology that we're looking at today actually doesn't exist to fix some of the problems we want for 20 by 2035 so we we have to really um, radically change and, and shift in, in, in you know, shift up here to try and address some of those issues and decarbonize very quickly and there's a lot of um, technology and work that's underway and that's, that's, that I'll talk about that shortly 
So I mentioned about um, looking at uh, what, what, does that, what does the infrastructure look like currently? What does that current policy say? So those two charts on the right hand side give you an indication of, um, you know, if we look at uh, plane line, which is the top half and uh, S and C. Um, so the blue section is the amount of uh, um, constructed uh, track that's constructed to um, sort of more modern sort of G G44 um, uh, type construction, F40 to G44 type construction. Um, so it's a more modern variant, it's N60 rail. And that that is probably mo most of our, our, our more resilient infrastructure, uh, CWL with, within that. And, um, and then you, you then start going to some of the older, older concretes, which are sort of the, the bright orange um, in the middle, big chunk in the middle, um, and then moving to timber and steel, which is towards the top. Um, but on top of that, we also know that, um, so, you know, in, in, in essence, if we carry on in the same trajectory for the next um, 30 years, uh, we'll, we should get to a position where around 62% of our, our infrastructure is installed to modern standards. Um, the challenges with S and C, where um, you know we've only got a really small proportion that actually has been um, modified to more uh, uh, modern variants, and um, in order to progress, we we probably going to have to accelerate some of that. But what what is interesting is actually if we don't accelerate, we carry on at the same pace. By 2050, we'll, majority of our main lines will actually be uh, modernised, which is which is good. Um, and we do have a lot of SNC which sits in sidings and you know, freight loops, which are probably not as urgent and certainly not as critical as some of, some of the mainline ones. But it's important that we can't forget those because it depends on where you know the, the train services are. If they derail off a side which is right adjacent next to a main line, um, it's those connections that could potentially cause um, disruption or even even um, uh, derailments, um, serious derailments at the top. So. That that's that that risk-based approach is certainly something we are um, already looking into, and something that we, we we need to be more targeted at to improve that um, our, our our management of those of the asset, the current asset base. Um, jointed track across the network is broadly speaking, um, if we look at the whole network, is it's probably about um, 10, 11 to ten percent um, across, you know, compared to CWR. So we have got majority of our infrastructure is CWR, which is good, but um, you know, joint track is still in some parts of the country, um, Wales and Scotland, parts of the northwest and east. Um, there's still quite a lot of that there, and um, that in itself presents the challenge. Um, you could argue, yes, replace all those. There's probably not a business case to do that everywhere, um, and in some parts of Scotland, we'll probably manage in the next 30 years still managing uh, the joint to track successfully. But it's it's the, it, the thing we need to recognise the skills fade um, as we lose skills um, from managing that sort of old asset. Um, we then get into some real challenges in terms of managing the asset uh, more effectively if we uh, we don't have the right skill set and you then need to consider well is it worth shifting to the more modern variant um, in that situation if we all our people to make sure that they you know don't lose that that uh, that competence so that plays very much into this and, and how we manage the asset um, <clears throat> there is there are also challenges. Um, and some of our current challenges and some of the work we are doing to implement improvements. So we we already um, tackle uh, hot, uh, some of our, our, our weather risks. We have uh, more enhanced uh, enhancements in terms of risk-based assessments, targeted summer and seasonal prep activities, whether it's uh, you know it's winter or summer. Um, and there's also a lot of um, sharing of uh, good practice across the regions and, and the routes. And we've started developing some of our, our predict and prevent tools that uh, track decision support tools are a good, uh, a good development and, and there's more going on in that space to provide more information so we can make some really good data, data um, um, bound decisions um, and potentially looking at you know, embedded uh, measurement technology as well. Um, we have lots of different types of technology out there in terms of monitoring and measuring um, dynamic movement and there's certain things we can start looking at um, rather than pushing people out in, in harm's way to look at mon monitoring those sort of uh, uh, defects and, and, and issues we've got out there um, to manage the asset more appropriately. 
um, during, uh, you know, in, in view of um, some of our uh, weather challenges. So what actions are we taking? Um, so I'll go, go through some of the, the things that we're doing around policy. Um, one of the things we recognize with policy is we need to, uh, we, we need to reflect our policies um, and the effects climate change has on our policies and how that may amplify risk um, and de develop adaptation plans um, and not just not just replace like for like but we need to effectively replace like for better um, by recognizing the effect of climate change so a, a good example of that is if we are if we are planning to replace a jointed track on say some, somewhere like the, the Wales or Western or the southeast area um, because that's the cheaper option. Um, that track could be in place for the next 30 50 to 50 years. Um, and in that time, we know what climate change is going to do for our infrastructure. So that kind of infrastructure wouldn't operate. We couldn't operate safely on um, when we get those sort of temperatures. So at that point, you need to understand why, why would we want to replace it now? We need to think ahead. Um, so although the initial costs may um, you know, may outweigh the, the cheaper version of going for jointed track and just like for like. The whole life cost element is something that would definitely help us um, in that we know that we recognise that as the weather heats up, um, we will be in a better place in terms of managing the asset longer term and we're not going to shut a line uh, on that basis. So that's a really key part of our, our policies and our strategy in terms of um, identifying the areas that we will help us to kind of anticipate what the weather is going to look like um, and develop um, ways of either resisting it or absorbing the effects um, either through adaptation or improved recovery plans to, uh, to avoid um, you know, serious uh, um, uh, disruption on the network. Okay, uh, and then the other the other things we've all started working on is the uh, we've started developing some GIS maps. Um, and this is part of our, our certainly part of our development strategy on uh, looking at vulnerability uh, risk assessment. So right now, if we you know we do we do we do some risk assessments, but it's very very arbitrary in the way in which we approach it, based on local knowledge um, and local inspections to give us that information. If we were able to develop that into a model that gave us that. Um, you know, pictorial and, and um, GIS mapping capability to look at hotspots across our network. It give us the ability then to understand where there are um, pinch points along along parts of our network that we then, um, particularly associated with weather and what the, what the effect um, weather has on it, both in terms of degradation but also in terms of the um, the uh, the the impact it has on the the actual asset itself when we get a, a, an extreme weather event. Um, so we can use that and use better tools to provide us be better decision making. And that's a really important um, piece of work that's been um, you know, currently underway um, in terms of vulnerability mapping. Um, and then in look, looking further as well, in terms of uh, other assets, um, we've got, uh, in terms of managing flooding, so we are, each region and each route has developed its own um, adaptation and, uh, and weather resilience plans. And one of the things it's looking at, is looking at where there are um, areas. Um, so a, a good example is County Bridge in Wales, which is known and prone to flooding every year um, and, and suffers, suffers quite significantly some years. And it's looking at those sort of areas and then identifying opportunities to not just do a like for like scheme because whenever we do that it floods again but actually looking at some more uh, you know um, some improved designs which help to actually take water away from that area and it's uh, yeah it's quite challenging in terms of the landscape there and the uh, the the it's a it's positioning next to adjacent and um to try and make sure that those are those sort of schemes are um almost bulletproof to some extremes of weather and um, those are the things we should be looking at um, and designing our drainage systems and also the infrastructure around it in order to do that now we can't do that alone um, in some situations i mentioned you know going back in my past looking at uh, work that we did on, on dawny bridge in, in maidenhead um, sometimes we, we we do need to work very closely with environment agencies uh, river authorities and look at you know look at what they're doing jointly 
and work together as a, as a, as a, as a collaboration to improve the way in which we manage the assets. Um, and all of that helps us in terms of managing where, where we're coming from. Um, and it will help us to build some resilience into the infrastructure for many years. So we're not just looking at you know, a, a short term um, improvement. We actually need to look at some long, longer term um, improvements we're making to the, to the infrastructure. Um, the other part that we are not so great at is measuring sort of the local and the national economic impact. And um, you know, when when we we had uh, we we disrupted the west the western Great Western Main Line um, at uh, Dawlish um, a few years ago, one of the things we identified, and it was the time of year that happened as well, um, but we effectively shut off the West Country, and that cost us. Yeah, there were there were a variety of ranges of uh, of, of economic impact, but anything from about um, three four hundred million to about a billion pounds in in lost revenue and uh, economic um, effect. So, you know, apart from a few million pounds for reconstructing the railway, um, the effect on the economy in that part of the world was actually you know, quite profound. Um, and we need to remember that that you know we we are a social network. Um, for the people of the United Kingdom, and we're not—it's not just a railway; it's a system of um, transporting people. And it's really important that we we recognise where where we sit in that uh, in in that um, part of the UK and the the part we play in the economy as well. Um, and then other, look, looking ahead in terms of the the in terms of track, um, so we've really started some work in terms of improvements on uh, research and development of dynamic lateral uh, lateral resistant models and we've done some work in Southampton uh, to try and model the effect of, uh, of hot weather uh, but also not just hot weather but the effect of different track constructions and we we recognize for instance that uh, you know there, there are there are several factors so small misalignment for instance uh, in, in the track itself uh, whilst it might seem quite innocuous because it's been there throughout uh, you know, for a number of years, but that could uh, could potentially degrade the track uh, and the buckling temperature um, by anything up to sort of seven or seven to ten degrees. And those sort of minor misalignments, which we sometimes ignore, um, because actually in Maine they don't really cause many problems. They could be there for years, but it's um, it's the the, the additional um, lateral resistance it's, that's lost. As a result of those um, minor things, and um, it may take, uh, you know, we, we generally look at things like wet beds and think, oh, that's that, that's where the errors, the issues are. But in some cases, it's it's place things that have been like that for a number for a while, um, and we don't necessarily we don't necessarily look at that in our standards. Um, so a minor mis misalignment will be deemed acceptable and tolerable um, when you take account of the other factors around lateral lateral restraint. There is a potential that that could, you know, as the temperature heats up, particularly, um, and become a factor for uh, potential buckle occurring. Um, and it's those sort of things that um, we probably need to get a better understanding on and be able to model those. Um, I mentioned about the model, modeling and um, looking at mapping capability as well, but it's also applying the, the wider systems thinking in terms of how, how where the track sits in association with um, with other assets like earthworks and drainage. Um, and thinking about the the wide implications, and you know, in some cases we would be better off spending money on on strengthening some of our earthworks and, so on, and, and improving some of our drainage systems, rather than um, unless we just keep placing the track because you know the track suffers as a consequence of some of those um, incidents. Um, that we 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 just change the track, um, but we could actually make some improvements in those, which provides resilience um, and a much better base for the track to sit on. Which um, potentially reduces degradation and wear as well. So there's a number of factors we, we need to think about and put our money in the, in the right places. Um, there's more work to be done. Uh, Stress-free temperature and assessment and um, measurement of stress. We've been doing this um, for the last probably 30 years in terms of how we measure stress um, in a quite a, a, a rudimentary fashion, and we need to think about how we do that going forward. Um, and even looking at Potentially regionalizing SFT, um, the stress free temperature. So, for you know, British Rail for many years ago, when COD, CWL was um, installed, decided 
to, to go for stress-free temperature for the UK. And there were a variety of reasons for that. It didn't make that much sense to change it and make it different. But when, when you look at the way in which um, the forecast for temperatures and projections for temperatures in the future, um, some parts of Scotland will, will, it won't be getting to temperatures that we see in, in parts of England today. Um, so we, you know, we, we need to look at is regionalising and stress-free temperature a, a, a better option, um, particularly as we've gone, you know, we, we, we've gone, we, we've devolved now. Um, Scotland may want to think about it in a different way, um, rather than going to some degree um, much more extreme um, in terms of managing their their their, their SFT the same way the southeast do. So, um, it might be being slightly over prescriptive and. It goes, goes back to, you know, we, are we trying to gold plate our railway? Are we trying to actually manage the infrastructure um, appropriately? I think that's where we need to be in future um, from, from the projectors we're seeing. Um, and then, um, you know, predict and prevent decision support tools rather than you know, walking along the infrastructure. We've got lots and lots of um, ways of automating the data. We need to get more into automation and measurement rather than just mark one eyeball all the time. Um, Mark on eyeball can do a lot of other things, but um, you know, automation and, and measurement is, has got to be the way forward. So we can actually, be, you know, actually be able to detect things and, and measure uh, variations um, far more smarter than, than we currently do. Um, and then improve and adapt some of our construction. And, and it could be as simple as you know changing the um, the sleeper spacing that we have. Um, we currently work to. Um, to, to kind of strengthen the, the track construction itself um, or tighten our tolerances in, in our standards. So I mentioned about you know, improving alignment and actually taking account of alignment a bit more than we do now um, and looking at the geometry element of it as well, sort of track bed and ballast um, interaction. Okay. So just um, to get towards the, the end of the presentation, um, I won't go through that those detail but the the network rail strategy for uh, sort of climate change and, and resilience and um, looking at a number of um, a number of things around uh, strategic action and, and investment so that, that's a key part of that and there's the whole industry strategic plan as well as the uh, rail technical strategy and those are all aligned together in terms of uh, driving uh, uh, climate change adaptation into our plans uh, there's risk assessments and action plans we do that today we need to we need to look at doing that in a more um, articulate way using um, you know, good good data uh, and measurement data and really automated so that it's uh, it's more consistent um, and reliable so getting down to sort of using a gauge r and r techniques is something that we should be using a lot more um, there's lots of research and analysis that we're currently doing but there's more that needs to be done um, we understand you know the the effect of lateral um, lateral resistance and we understand the effect of, uh, of buckles we understand that quite a bit but i think there's more to do in terms of looking at all the various parameters that could impact it and I mentioned work we're doing with universities uh, we need to do a lot more of that and, and, and encourage that sort of development to understand how we can adapt um, in a more um, risk-based risk approach um, and then um, i mentioned about staying changing some of the guidance and standards and you know looking at how do we um, yeah, potentially develop a cost benefit analysis tool that helps us to um, define and have a business, business justification for making certain changes um, associated with our policy, but also um, being able to justify making changes to potentially qualify SFT um, across different parts of the network. So just to conclude, um, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, climate change is happening. We, we need to adapt to it. It's not it's not a, uh, a thing that will pass, it will come with us, uh, whether we like it or not. Um, extreme high temperatures will increase and, you know, the buckle, the risk of buckles, if we don't do anything, will also increase with that. And so will the rise in train delays. Um, and, you know, more and more people come back to the railway after this pandemic. We will be, hopefully, and I'm sure we will get back to the situation, you know, that the rail is still the, um, the most environmentally friendly way of, of traveling and um, it's going to be uh, seen as that in, in many more years to come so we need to be prepared to uh, to adapt um, and change uh, in order to deal with uh, the challenges we face um, 
and we can do this with uh, you know collaboration across academia um, working with our industry colleagues but also working with external agencies and supply chain um, and that's that's an essential bit they've got a lot of skill sets that um, we we may not have a lot of expertise that we may not have and um, you know we can look outside other sectors and look at different ways in which they do things but also other railways you know there's um, learning we, we can get from other railways how other other countries uh, manage hot weather places like Saudi and Australia um, and we look at how other countries manage um, you know wet weather um, you know we're, we're we're in a very unique position in terms of our climatic conditions which are quite unique in a way um, but there's learning we can get from other other countries as well um, and that we can only do this by you know our ability to to uh, to make intelligent decisions and and adopt uh, the right technology to help us prevent problems but also um, to allow the railway to adapt um, for a long time we've sat now you know with our victorian past and we need to move forward um, to the future and cope with the challenges presented by climate change okay thank you very much that's all from me thank you rob we've got lots of questions for you anyway so i hope you're oh, prepared fantastic that's really good <laughs> look forward to that i'm sure there's the usual suspects that there are the usual suspects so i'll start so the first one was put from paul jeffrey actually it's a really good question uh has network rail uh, the rail delivery group and the dft etc actually accepted and recognized that we're actually in a climate emergency um so yes yes they have actually um so one of the things i mentioned about the the government's um asking the national infrastructure commission to do this assessment of infrastructure and it's not just the railway this is roads rivers river authorities local authorities um it so the defra has, has been the lead with this and they they are looking at uh, the effect of climate change and effectively every single infrastructure owner in the uk has been tasked with identifying an action plan and, and developing an action plan to um you know to to tell the government what are the risks you're currently managing and what are you doing about climate change. So yes, it's very much in the DFTs and, and the government's um, uh, agenda in terms of how we manage that. Um, and, you know, we, we, are, we are the knowledge hub in the railway. We've got to lead on that front and actually tell the government what we need to actually deliver on that. Um, and it's got to obviously be value for money. We can't just do it for the sake of doing it. We've got to demonstrate it's value for money. But, um, yes, definitely. The guy is, is something that is very much in the, in the forefront of the government's mind. Okay, thanks, Robert. You're right. It's definitely in our gift to make sure we do the right thing now, especially with the new challenge yeah. after COVID of having less money. Correct. So we've got to do even more smarter yeah. engineering. Okay. Precisely. Uh, Precisely. Ian, yeah. Ian Dean's asked a couple of questions about uh, about benchmarking and our European colleagues. One was about how how the Europeans manage uh operating of the temperatures you discussed at the beginning of your presentation but also yeah what kind of benchmarking have we done with our european counterparts looking at performance uh and delay uh, and how they manage in, on hot weather in, during the hot weather yeah so yeah that's a, that's a really good question um so we have looked at that we have looked at how other european countries um it's probably one of one of the challenges we have and i, and I mentioned i'll go back to the uh the climatic conditions we, we face in the UK, they are, because of where the UK is positioned, we do have some very difficult weather um, and extremes, but also a big variation of temperature um, compared to other countries in Europe. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, um, there are definitely things that they do better in Europe that we can learn from. And we've done some benchmarking with uh, with ProRail, who's probably probably the closest to our sort of weather. Um, you know, it's not not quite the extremes that we see, but certainly closest in terms of very variation in weather. And um, yeah, to some degree, we're leading in that space. Um, but a few examples from from France as well about how they manage things. Um, looking, you know, just just the way in which they manage the, the asset differently. Um, it's, and sometimes it's quite difficult to do comparisons because we, you know, we, we, we've done some benchmarking exercises in the last couple of years with, with Europe to see how many buckles they had and what you know, speed restrictions. And it's very difficult to extract that sort of information from them because um, they tend to talk about their main lines 
um, sort of the high speed lines as the areas that they they track and monitor. Whereas we look at home on infrastructure and say everything is you know is is up for grabs, um, yeah. and that makes it quite difficult to do a direct comparison with Europe um, because they're you know they're, they're sort of regional railways as they call them are, are tend to be they manage them as they see fit and it's yeah they don't necessarily manage the stats around those as, as diff, you know in the same way as we do so that's that's some of the challenges we have but nonetheless um, one thing to mention is we're working we're part of the uic um uh, sort of climate um, change uh, or climate challenge committee which is looking at the effect of climate on uh, on our railways um, so that's a piece of work that's just beginning um, and we are involved in that as well okay thanks rob uh, we've got a few questions around SFT. I mean, I raised one myself and Kevin uh, and Alex Stackhouse as well. Uh, you, you mentioned there the variation in temperature that we have to deal with. So we look at the hot weather, but uh, have we looked at the research into whether, you know, track CBR track as it is today, will be able to withstand the extremes of temperature, not just the hot days, but the cold days as well? Yeah. So yes. Um, so that is definitely something that's certainly in, in, in as part of the, the development and modeling we're looking at. Um, I think the the general view we've had from the climate scientists is the, the temperature will warm up. So the colder temperatures will also get warmer. Um, so that variation, although it will increase, will probably go up together as you know as a group. So it's not necessarily going to widen. Um, what the only problem we've got with that is there will be scenarios where uh, we, we've been advised that the the cold temperatures so where we get you know we, we've seen in the last couple of years we've seen minus close to minus 20 we will still get those incidents but where they might happen once every 10 20 years they may happen once every 50 years um so it will become less frequent but they could still occur and it's those sort of problems that can cause us some issues um, so we certainly need to look at it but i think again looking at it from a risk-based approach go well how often is that likely to happen where's that what's the likelihood um, and we need to measure up measure that in terms of the solutions that we we, we, we come up with um, I, I think the, the current variations we've got will increase slightly um, but we'll, we can take sft and accommodate that accordingly um, without you know making drastic changes um, to to the way in which we manage the asset, but I think certainly you know I can see SFT going up slightly to what it is today. And like you said, there could be regional variations in that. If if, if the where we found that was suitable, depending on the temperatures in Scotland and like said, southeast. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and it has to be. And it, it gets a bit tricky when you get toward the middle of the country about what where that's going to sit. But that's yeah. sort of the decisions we have to get to. And uh, yeah. I think that's it's, it's part of the uh, it'll need to be part of that decision about where, where we draw the line and uh, where, where it sits along there so yeah brilliant thanks Rob uh, a couple of questions around policy first of all uh, Pete Halliwell mentioned uh, he was intrigued to see the volume of jointed track remaining more or less constant for the next 38 years what if you had a view on that um so yeah that's, it's, it, it's an interesting point um so jointed track in some parts of the network i mentioned about sidings and some of our, our, our relief and, and if in uh, um, loop lines are jointed track and okay they may sit near the main line some don't um there's probably not a major argument i'll, I'll get a really simple example actually will be one on i don't know if anyone from western's on but western have a, a little track um a single line in uh, uh near acton and most summers and they tend to shut it uh it carries very little freight and when the freight do run they tend to be at night uh, so you know they've had seen scenarios where it, it's all jointed and it's very old jointed track um could they renew it yes they could but for the cost of it um and the disruption which is absolutely next to nothing they just shut the line when it gets hot mm. and then at night time they reopen it and it's fine and they do have buckles they have buckles there almost every year but because of, they know what the infrastructure is like it's very it's a protective buckle so they have a watchman there they manage the asset they close the line it tends to buckle they rectify it and things are running again and i think in the long run that might be appropriate for those sort of situations and those sort of locations rather than spend a fortune and you know we are in a constrained situation with that after yeah. post-covid 
um, and for a number of years, I think we will be. But we so we need to recognise and, and prioritise the activity appropriately. Um, you could argue that there's some parts of our network, maybe more than part of the of the um, you know, and probably places like Wales, where we probably need to think a lot closely about what we do with certainly any piece. And there are some joint to track there. You could argue, you know, why why do we we probably need to um, you know, enhance some of that um, construction? But it just won't stand the test of time. It, it's going to go eventually. It'll become an, an, you know, to a point where you can't run any services. So yes, I, I, I would see that jointed track um, will diminish slightly. Looking at our policy, it doesn't necessarily support it, but I think the benefit of devolution is it enables regions to make that that case based on uh, on you know what what's actually operating on that part of the infrastructure and how they uh, they want to run things regionally. So I think yeah I think the the, the basis of devolution will enable um, a, re a reduction will see a reduction over time to get to a better place. Yeah. I think you're right there, Rob. Uh, I think there's probably an opportunity for us to. Uh, revisit some of the good engineering that we've done in the past years where we've we've cascaded materials uh, and we've not been so good at that over the last few few years uh, so there's a real opportunity to have a circular economy again uh, which again absolutely. of course is, is good for the, as far as carbon goes it is yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. okay uh, and Andy Savage has raised a really good point actually about converting jointed track to CBR and the fact that actually you probably want to be focusing on the, the uh, bits of jointed track that we've got left in areas that are predominantly CWR, because that's probably a bigger risk than an area where you've got predominantly jointed track and everyone knows how to maintain it there. So I think mm. that's all, but that's probably connected to the last comment you made, I think, Rob, on that. Yes, um, yeah, that's right. And, and again, I think it's it's, it's skills paid, you know, there's, there's ways in which we can manage those better and, and uh, you know, skills paid is, is important. We need to keep a uh, skill set going. Um, but it's yeah, it's just weighing up uh, the, the the situation from a regional basis. So I think that's really important. Uh, Gareth asked a question about how we convert our projections of asset construction type into projections of asset safety and performance risk. How do we articulate the business case to improve resilience? Very good question. Yes, that's a very good question, Gareth. Um, so, yeah, so I I think I, I think this is. Um, it comes down to some of the modeling. So we, we've really started some of this work um, with, with universities. Um, and I think there's there's an opportunity to um, you know to break down into the, the various elements which, which affect um, lateral stability um, and also look at the different rail rail weights and the rail rail sizes. Um, so I think there's there's a way of articulating that use, using I mean we've got something like a common consequence tool which gives us some indication of uh, where where um, we can look at the safety impacts. Um, we need to look better at the performance data. I think the performance data is is is, is quite um, immature at the moment in terms of how we measure things, and and it's a little bit arbitrary in, in terms of you know we, we may you know I, I spend a lot of years looking at um, a buckle data and the performance is related to buckle data, and it was very difficult to decipher some of that you know even to find where there had been a buckle because the way in which we capture stuff. So I think we, we definitely can get a lot smarter about that. And there's some tools uh, recently, there's something on Angular that's been developed by um, Hitachi, and there's some, some tools that have been developed with, with uh, uh, Northwest and Central by, by Amy, looking at performance data. I think we need to overlay all those um, different solutions and different systems, but then look at the track construction, see what that's, uh, that's given us and, and, and develop a model. Um, one of, I suppose, one of my challenges we, we we've got is the modelling we we get we have currently um, focuses a lot on renewal and, and um, gives us some indication of uh, um, what the asset age does. But if we start looking at different um, factors that influence the degradation of a particular asset um, and can influence the, the asset in terms of condition, um, I think we'll be in a better place to be able to articulate that um, and then look at the cost implications of that. Um, and we, we we've developed some. Uh, you know, within R and D, that we've developed some um, uh, um, some modelling tools looking at uh, um, a, a benefits calculator, and those sort of things can help us to actually understand um, the implications. If we change a particular asset or we modify a specific asset to give us some uh, some additional strength, 
what does that mean in terms of the safety and performance impact? Uh, I think so. I think there's quite a bit to do, um, yeah. but it's about overlaying all those into into a, a framework and a model that gives us, um, you know, an output at the end, um, which can help us to do that. And that, uh, we we have to do that through working with our universities. I think that's a really key thing to develop that capability, um, and then we can look at tools um, as a as a system to develop that. And, that, and as you say, Rob, that becomes more and more important, especially in the cash constrained world, where we need to be careful about how we spend our money and be able to yes. demonstrate we spend, you know, having value. Uh, yes, absolutely. We do spend money, so. Correct. Yeah, really yeah, and that's that's really really important. And you know, being able to to being able to demonstrate that um, is is highly important. So we can uh, we we yeah, we're doing the we know we're doing the right things, and we, we're actually um, providing that evidence we're doing the right things. And I think I think all of that is really important because. You know, when we go cap in hand to the government and future, we're still going to be doing that. Um, we can be able to demonstrate value for money. Um, it's a very hard case to push back against, um, but we've got to lead the way in that and, and, and lead the government to wanting to actually spend um, spend the money wisely. So. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. Well, Rob, that's been fascinating, uh, very thought-provoking uh, talk for us. Uh, it's great to see that, that Network Rail is really thinking about what the challenge is. Uh, research and development obviously key to this now, looking at new technology, uh, especially in the way that the actual assets perform and the impact the weather will have on the assets and, and what that means. And mm -hmm. the fact that we need to think of it as a system. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not just track, it's, it's earthworks, it's drainage, it's tracks, it's structures. And it's a systems approach that we need to take to make sure that we uh, manage the impact of any of the change in the climate. So thanks for that. That's been really good. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for the sessions. And uh, in the usual way, we would clap you, but obviously we can't do that online. Very well. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll hand over to Kevin if he's got anything else to wrap up on. Uh, I haven't got anything uh, to add, but just to, just to say thank you to. Uh, everybody for participating in it and the questions that were raised and we hope to uh or well the two sections hope to see you or see our members face to face sometime in the not too distant future and i hope you all That's have good. a good summer and we will yeah. see you in, uh, in you. early september thanks kevin thanks everyone Appreciate thanks that. everybody